Lord's Day service as we gather this morning to worship and glorify our King, our God, who has gathered us here by His grace and mercy. Uh, let's take some time to silently pray and prepare our hearts as we come before our gracious Lord, our gracious Father, that we come not in our strength, not in our might, but we come because of His grace to us in Christ. So we come in Christ's name, we come by His blood, we come by His righteousness, that we can draw near to our God, that as we draw near, we know that the Lord is here present with His people, that the Lord is present where His Word and His Spirit dwell, that His presence here as He meets His people. Let's pray that we would have eyes that are open to see His glory this day, to behold His radiance, to behold His majesty, and to be continually changed by His grace for His glory. Let's take some time to pray this morning. Come 
with hearts that have often been faithless, distrusting in your name and your word, or that we have sought other ways and we have gone astray as sheep from the shepherd, or that we have failed to live as you have called us to live in your light, that Lord, we have failed to love you with our very hearts, with all of our strength and all of our minds and minds, or that we have failed to love one another because of this as well. And yet, Lord, we know that we are not left in our shame and in our sin, but Lord, we look to your grace that you so freely offer to us in Christ. That Lord, that you call us to repentance and you call us now to faith. Lord, so we pray that you would strengthen your church by your very word and your spirit. But Lord, we know that apart from you there is no hope. And Lord, we know that only from you comes the words of eternal life. So Lord, as we run to you, Lord, we pray, would you reveal to us the depth of our depravity, the depth of our sin, and yet, Lord, may we see that your grace reaches far deeper. That, Lord, that as you call us into the light, that we may live as children of light. That, Lord, as you call us as now your heirs in Christ, that we would now live as your children of the kingdom. That, Lord, that you would convict our hearts so deeply and encourage us so well by your word. That we would have one sole desire to seek after your ways, to be used for your glory, and to see your glory fill the earth through your church. So Lord, this day, would you renew us in your strength? Would you renew us in the grace of your gospel to us, the mercy that we find in Christ, given to us so freely by his blood, and knowing that he is alive and seated at the right hand and shall return again. And Lord, that we are not a people filled with vain hope, but where we await for the hope of glory in Christ. So, Lord, this day, as you gather your church, as you gather your people, Lord, as you gather us here at OKPCA, Lord, we pray that you would fill our hearts, stir in our, our hearts, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth, that you may be glorified, that you, in all of your glory, may be greatly praised. For, Lord, you are the God who is great, and surely you are to be greatly praised. So Lord, this day would you humble us before you to hear your words of life, to come before you gathered by your Spirit and in your Spirit that you may receive all the glory. Lord, would you open our eyes to behold the beauty of our King. Lord, would you continue to stir in our hearts to change us and transform us into your likeness. That we would pray, Spirit, would you make us able? So Lord, as you draw us near, we pray from our Korean ministry, and children's ministry, and English ministry here this morning. Lord, we pray that we would draw near and we would respond in faith by your grace. But Lord, we also pray for those who are not with us today, those in our even in our English ministry and our the rest of our church who are recovering from surgery, from those whose bodies are full of pain and sickness. Lord, we pray that you would bring a great comfort. Lord, we know that you are the God who knows their bodies far more than anyone else. Lord, we pray that you would bring great healing, that it would be a great testimony to your glory and to your grace. That, Lord, that we may all worship together. Lord, we await that day in which Christ will come and make all things new. And yet, Lord, today, on this Lord's Day, where we know that you gather us here in anticipation of that one day that will come, that reality as we stand before your throne, before the Lamb that was slain on our behalf, where sin and death shall be no more, that where we taste of that even here and now, as you are with your people this day. So Lord, we thank you. We pray that you would receive all glory and blessing and honor. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
blood, your blood speaks the better word than all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth. His righteousness for me stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. Sing that again. Your blood speaks a better word than all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth. His righteousness for me stands in my defense. Jesus is your blood. What can wash? What can wash away our sins? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash us pure as snow? Welcomed as the friends of God. Nothing but your blood, nothing but your blood, King Jesus. Your cross, your cross, testifies in grace. I love the Father's heart Make a way for us Now boldly we approach Not earthly confidence Only by It's only by your blood What can wash What can wash away our sin What can make us whole Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash, what can wash us pure as snow? Welcomed as the friends of God. Nothing but your blood, nothing but your blood. What can wash away our sins? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash? What can wash us pure as snow? Welcomed as the friends of God. Nothing but your blood, nothing but your blood, King Jesus. Their own soul could yield. Our shame was deeper than the sea. Your grace is deeper still. Say that again. Who, oh Lord, could save themselves? Their own soul could heal. Our shame was deeper than the sea. Your grace is deeper still. You alone can rescue. You alone can save. You alone can lift us from the grave. You can 
weeping down to find us Let us out of there You alone belongs the highest praise You are Lord You, O Lord, have made a way the great divide you, you. For when the hearts were far away, your love went further. Yes, your love. Yes, your love goes further.
please holy gracious father loving everlasting father lord we thank you that we are here among friends and family to worship you to get to know you lord to grow closer to you we pray for this offering we pray that we know your will will be done but we humbly ask that you would just bless us with it lord you've given us so much because you are just everlasting and merciful and loving we thank you for that, for being that to us, Lord. Bless this day. Bless Pastor John as he's about to speak your word. Anoint him with your Holy Spirit. Let your words come out of his mouth. And when we receive it, Lord, let us not just listen with our ears, but listen with our hearts so that we take this message to heart and we utilize it in our lives. We think we chew on it. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. In Christ, in name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, let us now stand and greet one another in the name of Christ. If you will uh, turn in your bulletins, we'll look at a few of the announcements that are here. Uh, once again... We welcome all of you here in the name of Christ. It's wonderful, once again, every week that the Lord gathers His people to come and worship His name. And as we come here, once again, we welcome you here in the name of Christ. Uh, number two, uh, there will be a youth group PTA meeting. This is for the parents of youth students. Today from 1.30 p.m. The location has changed. It is not in the library, but will be in the choir room uh, in the um, Sunday school. Uh, number three, w WIC officers meeting will be today at 1.30, and they will not be at the choir room. They will be um, in the library. So we've switched locations uh, in case uh, you're wanting to think about easily uh, where we'll be. Uh, number four, Deborah Mission Committee will have a meeting today, and this will start at 1 p.m. in the library. Uh, number five, the 2018-2019 Awana Leadership Training Conference schedule is listed here. Uh, there are two conferences, the first August 12th on Sunday uh, from 1.15 to 3.45. 
p.m. And the second conference will be August 18th, which is a Saturday from 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. If you have any questions or comments on that, please contact Commander Scott Herber or Assistant Commander Myung Suk Lee. Uh, number six, with that, the 2018 to 2019 Awana uh, Club will begin on August 19th uh, with the opening ceremony at 1.30 p.m. And this also means that registration will be held on August 12th and 19th during lunch in the Fellowship Hall. So please keep that in mind. Uh, number seven, the MIC Special Worship Service will be August 12th at 2 p.m. The WIC meeting will be on August 12th as well at 1.15 p.m. Uh, there will also be a meeting uh, together with the church session and ordained deacons, which will be on August 19th at 2 p.m. Uh, the senior group will have their meeting on August 13th at 10.30 a.m. Uh, number 11, this is uh, just for you to know that there are new uh, Korean ministry tea classes or Bible study classes that are opening. So if you know anybody that might be interested, a spouse, a friend, whatnot, um, please let Reverend Lee know uh, if you're wanting to register. There's four different classes that are opening there. Uh, number 12, uh, OKPC Youth Group and Children Ministry invites all parents and the children and youth uh, to a back-to-school beach outing, which will be this Saturday, August 11th, uh, at Frank Rendon Park. That's where we'll be meeting uh, if you're not meeting at church. The uh, directions are right there. Um, the schedule for the time that we'll be there at the beach will be 10.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. And so all the youth, uh, please make sure that you guys are able to sign up and uh, please let me know if you are in need of rides or, or whatnot. Um, but if you are going to be departing from the church, whether you're needing to carpool or anything like that, uh, if you're departing from the church, you need to be here promptly by 9.30 um, if you're here at 9.31, you will have been one minute too late. So please make sure you're here by 9.30. Uh, sign up on the Back to School Beach Outing list, which is back there on the Fellowship Hall. Please sign up today so that Pastor Daniel and I uh, can organize everything easily uh, with regards to food and rides and all of those things. Um, please don't send me a text uh, Friday night. That will be very, very difficult. So please sign up today. Talk to your parents, guardians uh, for that. Uh, number 13, there will be a welcoming meeting for new members during the second quarter. This will be August 19th at 4.30 p.m. Uh, and this is f uh, for those who are attending should be uh, all Oikos leaders' families and officers and Kwanzaa's family should be there as well. Uh, just special EM announcements. YFC, we will continue this Friday um, with YFC for the youth starting at 6.30 p.m. with dinner. And so we hope to see all the youth there. Uh, this Friday. And number 15 as well, the EM Adults Pentateuch Bible Study will be meeting this Wednesday at 7.15 p.m. Uh, just as note with this, uh, if you haven't seen coming this way, I'm not sure if they have signs coming this way, but this Wednesday on the 8th, uh, there is going to be some sort of detouring to get to, I think, through D'Angelo Drive. Uh, they're doing some sort of work on D'Angelo Drive, and so just please keep that in mind uh, when you guys come for Wednesday meetings, uh, that there will be some sort of blockage and they'll be sending you through some detours to get to the church um, so please keep that in mind uh, if you have any questions about any of the announcements uh, please let me know after service please ask me after service and i'll try to best answer them to the best of my ability uh, with that we'll continue on in our sermon series on the ten commandments and so please open in your bibles to exodus chapter 20 verse 15 and this whole summer, we've been really making our way through the Ten Commandments. And we are actually towards the end of the Ten Commandments. We're not at the tenth yet, but we are getting there slowly and surely. And I hope that as we've been going through the Ten Commandments, that what we've been seeing is that the Ten Commandments aren't just about laws that God gives to Israel or to his people out of Egypt. But they, these are very much the heart of God to his people. It's very much the heart of what it means when we say Christian living. What does it mean to live as a Christian? What does it, lead, what does it, what does it mean for us to live as God's children and children of the light, children of his kingdom? Well, we can sum it all up here in the Ten Commandments as we see God's heart revealed to his people of this is the way we are called to live in the light. 
Right? That what we see here is that God is showing us the way in which we are to live a life with him and reflecting his glory as we were once too. Right? That as we were in the garden when we remember Adam and Eve, that when they were created, they were created to be image bearers of God. Right? That is the most fundamental thing of every human being, that we are to be an image bearer of God. And how is that to be played out? Well, we see that happening as God gives the summary of, of the law to us in these Ten Commandments. Here is Christian living. Here is how you love the Lord. Here is how you live according to what he has called you to. You see, these are essential to our lives. It's essential to the blueprint of what it means to love Christ and ultimately to love God. So we come to the eighth commandment this morning. I'll read God's word from Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. Pray that the Spirit would open our hearts to not just hear his word, but to really respond in faith, to open our eyes to see his glory. And then we'll dive right in. So this is God's word from Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. You shall not steal. And this is God's word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God who speaks to us. And you are the God who speaks through your very word. That Lord, your word is perfect and eternal, never failing and never fading. Lord, as we come before you, as your word is preached and proclaimed this morning, would you open our hearts, that your word would be planted deep in our hearts, God, that we would bear the fruit of transformation by your grace and by your spirit. For, Lord, we know you have started a good work in our hearts, and we pray that you would bring it unto completion when we see you face to face. So, Lord, this day, may Christ be seen in the scriptures. May Christ be applied to our very hearts. And Lord, may you be honored and glorified and worshipped in all of our lives. So Lord, we thank you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to the Eighth Commandment, right? we live in a society today, we live in a world today that would very much agree with this. Right? Stealing, theft, is horrible. Nobody should do it. But as Christians and as, as, as ones who see God as the fundamental, as God is the primary objective of these commandments, right? That as we think about the Ten Commandments, what well, lies central is actually life with God. Life of holiness, life of happiness, life of living as, as, as those who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. We have to go much deeper than just the way that society says, don't take what's not yours. Right? This commandment goes so much deeper than just saying, don't take what's not yours. Right? As we've been looking at all the Ten Commandments, we first and foremost have to realize that these Ten Commandments are often left in a very broad stroke. And God does that very deliberately. Because God is saying something to his people here and now. Right? God is not trying to simply change the behavior of his people just for the sake of changing behavior. God, through his very gospel, through the person of Christ, through his work, through the gospel of grace, is changing people, their lives, their hearts. Essentially, God knows the depth of our sin. And as we come here in the Eighth Commandment, I pray that once again, you won't come and approach this commandment and say, this means nothing for me. Because as we've been looking, and as James so clearly points out, all of us have failed to the commandments of God. And if you somehow think that you have not, you are living disillusioned lives. Right? Just because you... Feel like you don't doesn't mean that you don't actually, right? So if a, if a tree falls and nobody sees it, has a tree still fallen? Yes. 
So what God is doing as he shows us the grace of these Ten Commandments is that it's to reveal to us our, our very sin. It's to reveal, it's to actually wound us so that we may run to Christ. If the Ten Commandments, as we approach, if it, if it somehow leaves a moral righteousness in your hearts, then we fail to really come and approach God's word. Because, of, but what, because what we are seeing here, and what the people of God will see later as they continue to walk with the Lord, is that they have been faithless to their faithful God. And that is a scary, hopeless place to be. If we are to rescue ourselves. You see, the, the Ten Commandments shows the very character, the very nature of the heart of God, of who God is. You see, as God lays out the blueprint of who he is, he's, he's reminding us of what it means for us to live in happiness and holiness. And that is life, a relationship with God that is restored. These laws, once again, every week that we've been looking at, these are not impersonal. It's not just breaking a law. But as we fail to truly live to these commandments, we actually fail to love God as he has loved us. In fact, it's not only just to fail in loving, it is to hate God at his very word. So as we come to this eighth commandment, you shall not steal. Essentially, what we see here is a very, very big heart matter when we come to the idea of stealing. That ultimately, stealing, as we'll see, is not so much about, it's not bad just simply because you're taking someone else's things. There's a deeper thing that each and every one of us is guilty of. It's often found in the fact that we are discontent with our lives, our circumstances, and that leads us to lack in our trust of a very sovereign and gracious God. Of his provision for us. So you see this. Because God in Christ has provided every blessing for our every need. That he is the God who knows our every need even before we ask of it. That he is the one who knows our lives so deeply and our needs so deeply in Christ. And he has provided every blessing. We must trust with hearts that are full of contentment in his ways, his sovereignty, for his glory. So this morning we'll be looking at two main points. As we've been looking at almost every commandment, it's, it's a follow suit. The first is simply the foundation of this commandment. And secondly, we'll be kind of looking at the implications of what this means for us. So first, as we think about the foundation of the com commandment, once again, I want to remind all of you that this commandment, like every one of these commandments, is left in a very broad brushstroke. Right? That we have to remember, once again, the context in which God gives this to his people. He is not just giving this to criminals who are guilty of theft. He's giving this to every single person of the people of God. Out of all the Ten Commandments that he gives, he gives this one as the eighth. You shall not steal. He's not simply calling out a specific group of people. He's calling out the whole people of God. Because God knows the very intent of the sin that is in our hearts. The depravity of each and every one of us that is prone to steal. And we'll get to a little bit further along what this actually means for us to steal. But first we have to remember... This is a word to all of God's people. This is a word to all of those whom God has brought out of Egypt and into the light. This is a word to all of God's people whom he has redeemed past the Red Sea as he stretches out his mighty hand to bring forth his people by his promise, his covenant, his faithfulness. This is a commandment for all of God's people to hear. 
And as we've been looking since the fifth command, we've been looking at how our love for God, and as we seek to serve God in all things, as we seek to have God as the primary objective of our life, for His glory of life with Him, that it naturally and inherently is tied with how we love our neighbors. And we've been seeing how in the second tablet, how a natural outflow of loving God will tend for us to love our neighbors. But in a very strange way as well, we might also see this. When we fail to love our neighbors, very clearly are we failing to love the Lord. And once again, loving your neighbor is not simply doing external good things for people. I can do very nice things for all of you, and yet in my heart harbor an anger and envy towards you. And you can do the same. Loving one another is not merely left externally. In fact, that's not loving at all. If deep in your heart you hate the one whom you're doing nice things to. It's a heart issue. You see, as God gives this commandment, it's not just for moral purposes alone. It's not just about getting along with somebody else. It's ultimately about God. It's ultimately about your life and your standing before God. It's ultimately about your relationship with a God who is so faithful to his relationship with his people. And we see the broad brushstroke of this. You shall not steal. And these four words... Very, very specifically, the writer, Moses, who writes this, to to write it down here. And as God gives this law by speaking it to his very people, he does not specify a certain object or certain people. And for that very reason, is to leave it in a very, very broad brushstroke. So the real question that we have to ask then is, What does it mean for us to steal? What is stealing? Right? From culture to culture, from age to age, there is a common way in which we might think of stealing, you know, unjustly taking something that is not yours. But the extent of that seems to change. But as we see from the word of God, his word does not change. His commandments stay the same. And they are just as pure as they once were, as he said it to his people here at Mount Sinai. Ultimately, what we'll see is the foundation for stealing is a heart that's full of discontent, a heart that is restless. Right? Stealing, yes, can be seen from an external perspective. And we often think of stealing in a very materialistic way. Right? Just simply taking something that's not yours. Or even... Some in the world, taking people who are not yours. Kidnapping. And as we see in our world today, we need to be aware of also the fact of human trafficking, sex trafficking, child labor for for trafficking, all of those things. It's growing. If you're not aware of those numbers, you're not aware of anything. (laughs) But here's the problem that we have in this world. Here's the problem that we have when we think about loving our neighbor. And this is the problem, I think, that happens in Western Christianity. It's the problem that happens in the United States. If it doesn't deal with you explicitly, it doesn't matter. If it's not happening to you, oh well, that's a really bad circumstance for you, but at least it's not happening to me. That is a very, very selfish mentality, and that is actually the heart of this commandment. To be discontent, to be lacking of your trust in the Lord's sovereignty, it will ultimately lead you to be a person who only cares about yourself. 
You see, it's deeply profound as we come before the commandment here, the eighth commandment, that we see a deeply profound reality of the human heart. That every single person, the extent of sin, the extent of our depravity, that we, as we come before God's holy law, that each and every one of us in this extent has failed. You and I both. Right? Rather than resting in the Lord's sovereignty for you, we are often found with hearts that are restless, anxious. Rather than being filled with being content in the ways and the places that God has placed you in, even in tough seasons, we are found with hearts that are discontent. For the Lord's ways, provisions, His watching over our life, does not seem good enough. You know, a good example of this, of how we can kind of measure our hearts of discontent, our hearts of lacking trust is this. In times of need, in times of your struggle, in times of these seasons here and now, how often are you praying? How often do you pray? How often do you humbly come before God and say, this is out of my control? Lord, teach me. Show me your way and what you are doing. But Lord, most of all, even if this does not change, teach me to trust in you. If you're lacking in a prayer life, a real prayer life with the Lord, I will probably say this, that you are probably living a life that is very discontent. You are living a life that is not trusting in the Lord. Because how else, how else will you see what God is doing if you do not humbly ask before him? And if you humbly don't care? If you are not praying, and you say, I don't have enough time to pray. It's too boring to pray. It takes too long. You have not understood your need. But I will affirm this. Every one of us in this room, because of sin, I'm sure is living a very anxious life. In times of need, do we turn in humble prayer? You know, I'm reminded of Pentateuch Bible study. We've been going through the life of Abram. And we got to this place of where we you know, God has promised Abram that an offspring will come. Right? The promised one will come. Right? Through him and through Sarai, his wife. You know, Abram, throughout his whole journey with the Lord, years and years and years pass, and he has no offspring. You know what Abram gets? He gets a great idea. Let me just help the Lord with this process. He's already promised this. It's just not coming to fruition. So let me help him. The Lord does not need your help. The Lord did not need Abram's help. In fact, when Abram tried to help the Lord, he in fact didn't help at all, rather fell into sin. Fell into distrust. Fell into discontentment. So the question And really what we need to ask, do you truly believe the promise that for you who are in Christ, that the Lord provides for your every need by his grace? Do you truly have those words of Paul resonate in your hearts that the Lord's grace, God's grace is truly sufficient for me and it meets my every need and my every weakness? Because if not, we begin to see the profound reality of the darkness of the human heart due to sin. We are all prone to stealing. Whether that be from one another, whether that be the time and energy, whether that even be stealing from the blessings that God has given you. And 
first and foremost with a heart of discontentment in the Lord's provision for your life. You see, there's a big, due to sin, there's a big distrust in our hearts. There's a distrust in the Lord's sovereignty. There's a distrust in others. And often what happens here is we become selfish. Whatever floats my boat is what's best. You see, stealing is not merely external things. It starts from the heart. What's scarier than just stealing things is a heart that is prone to steal. That is what needs to be of our concern. And so for those of you who are still maybe saying, well, I've never stolen anything, I will say you have. You see, there are countless ways in which we steal, and there's too many for us to list. Right? We might steal directly. In other words, we might steal uh, from somebody, a material thing. We might steal from a store. We might steal someone's time. You know, this is why we're always saying we should always be on time. Especially if someone's waiting for you. You're taking up their time. You might, you might steal someone's credit. Not as in credit as in, you know, finances, but credit as in where somebody has done something, you might take a little bit of that glory for yourself. You might, for the students, cheat on your tests and papers. You might, you might not even read a book that you're supposed to read and make an assignment like you read it. That is cheating. If that doesn't, if that doesn't drive with you well, it shouldn't. Because that is stealing. And ultimately, in stealing directly, we actually see this. It ultimately is, is at the expense of another. It's always exploiting somebody. It's always exploiting someone or something. And so in this day and age, where we're so politically correct about everything, and for those who seem like they're standing up for the oppressed all the time, if you're not standing for the gospel first, you are going to exploit somebody. You see, the reason is that first and foremost, a heart that longs to steal is a heart that is opposed to God and his ways. And ultimately then, is a heart that is only for itself. And as selfishness grows, you, it will lead you to exploit another. It will lead you to exploit another by stealing one's time, even one's life, one's skill, one's job, and the list goes on and on. But remember, I, uh, I've, I've only said that these are just directly felt. If these are going on and you let them pass and others are able to do these things as well, you are indirectly as well allowing for these things to happen. But more primary to all of this, the great foundation of our very sin in our hearts is actually the fact that we steal what is God's. If everything that we firmly believe is from God and His grace, as He's poured out His blessings upon us, if we do not use our very life, our every blessing, our every material things that we've even received from Him, if we do not use it for His glory, for His church, for His gospel to go forth, for His kingdom to go to the earth and to all the lands, then you are stealing from God. Because why has God blessed His people? So that you may be a blessing unto the nation. This also goes to say, stealing God's time. Sundays, when we come to worship, the day that God has called us to rest, 
not just for 60 minutes, but to set apart a whole day for his glory. May we come before him, not merely on our own time, but on God's time. And I promise you, there will be weeks that that's very tough, but I promise you the blessings that abound from resting in Christ for a whole day, setting it apart, preparing for this day throughout your week, those six days that you have as you work, as you labor, that maybe it demands for you to be a little bit more diligent so that you may have this day simply for the Lord's sake. The Lord promises that your life, your family will be blessed. You will see the Lord work in miraculous ways, in marvelous and glorious ways from the mundane and the routine. Right? The question we have to ask ourselves, is this and has this been the reality of our lives? You know, this is just very briefly even looking at the extent of what sin is. These aren't, these aren't even all the examples that can be listed. You see, a restless heart, unless it is found in the gospel as a heart that is ready to steal. Not just for you, but also for me, for all of us. So what does this call for then? As we think about the implications, as the Lord who graciously gives. Well, the first is that, as we come before God's word this morning, is a call for each and every one of us to repent. Not merely repent to one another, that's fine. Confess to one another. But ultimately, repenting to the Lord. We have not lived according to how he has called us, and therefore we have not loved him as we ought to. We have not let his word be our authority in life. And therefore we have not seen him as our gracious Lord in our lives. We have failed to love the Lord in all his ways. Right, some question, you know, as we think about repentance, this is not just merely to say we pray and we say we're sorry. You know, the Puritan Thomas Watson, he says this so beautifully. Repentance is a gift of God's grace by his spirit that inwardly humbles you before God and it also visibly forms and transforms you. There is heart change when it comes to repentance. It's not just inwardly humbling you, but it will also bear the fruit of being visibly reformed and transformed into the likeness of Christ. You know what's worse than actually, you know, repenting? What, what, what's worse of looking like you're repenting is, or, or what's, worse than, what's worse than not repenting is, is the fact that you might look like you're repenting and you're really not. And so the question we, some of the questions we might ask today are, who are the people that we've discredited? Who are the people we've stolen from, whether materially or whether in a more, you know, other way of stealing someone's time, someone's credit, stealing someone's work, cheating. But more importantly with that, What are the ways that you have stolen from God? Whether that be that you're holding back on your on your on your on your on your money or finances, whether that be your time and your energy to the church, whether that be even of 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 your own family and your life, or whether that be how well you've been prepared to come and worship the Lord each and every week. The list goes on and on and on. You see, everything is from him. Everything is for him. 
Have we truly used everything in our lives for His glory alone? If you have not, then you are stealing from His very blessings He gives you. Because once again, He has blessed you so that you may be a blessing. See, once again, repentance is this gift of God's grace that comes from God himself. And it first and foremost shows us the reality of the darkness of sin, of, of, of how prone our hearts to, in this specific way, to, to steal. But it also calls for us to turn away from ourselves and to run to Christ. You see, the Lord is not wanting to just simply shame us. The Lord is calling you back to Him. So the real question here today is that will you listen to His Word and turn to the Lord in true repentance and faith? If not, if you are not going to respond to His Word this day, then you are blatantly saying, I hate your ways. Because why would you ever, ever turn away from living water? You see, the Lord is, is, is pointing to us as we see the, the, the danger of what comes from the Ten Commandments, the fact that each and every one of us, as we stand before God, that we are deserving of His judgment, of His wrath, that, that we have truly sinned against God, that we truly have gone against His commands, but we've also loved God living in our sin. And it's His commandments that as it reveals to us how we have sinned against God, as it breaks our hearts, that the Lord shows us the one and only solution to a restless and discontent heart, and that is Christ Himself. The only cure for a depraved heart that seeks pleasure in disobedience is to look to the one who lived in perfect obedience in our place. You see, Christ is calling us by His very word this morning. The Lord is calling us. And just as we remember that thief on the cross next to Christ, there were two thieves, one who mocked the Lord and one who came to the Lord and said, Do not forget me. And I pray that the words of what Christ spoke to that thief may be the resonating anthem of our hearts, of joy. As Christ says to that thief, today you will be with me in paradise. Christ this morning is calling the thieves. Christ is calling the breakers of his laws. Christ is calling those who are discontent in their lives to find rest in him. May that resonate, those sweet words of Christ resonate to us. There's forgiveness that abounds in our Lord. There's mercy and grace that is freely given. But what it calls for us is that we come in faith, believing in His very words. So the question is that I ask you before we close this morning. What is it that holds your life from turning to the Lord this day? You know, this professor, Dr. Kruger, who is um, in Charlotte, North Carolina, he says this, Delayed obedience makes obedience a lot harder. Delayed obedience makes obedience a lot harder. You see, Christ is calling you today. Not tomorrow. Not next week. He's saying, come today, find your life. Find that in obedience to his ways, that this is the blessed life with your Lord. Find and see the riches of his grace that he gives. Find that your eyes may be open as you humbled in prayer of how the Lord continues to provide for you day after day after day after day, that you are in need of him and apart from his blessing and grace to you, that our life will not reach another day. So be filled with contentment in the Lord. Be filled with a greater trust. 
in him and do not delay in responding to his word. He's calling each and every one of us here this day. There's not one who is too far for the love of Christ. So with that, I pray that as we come before the Christ, as we respond to his word, may we be transformed by the renewing of our minds, by the work of his spirit in us. May we cling to Christ with all of our life, trusting in his word and his promise each and every moment, knowing that his provision is sufficient. His grace is more than enough for us each and every day. So with that, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that you would continue to cause our hearts to respond your word, not just to hear it in one ear and out the other, but Lord, may we respond to you, to cling to you, to turn to you in true repentance, Lord. Lord, we are in need of your grace and your mercy. Lord, may we see the riches of your blessings in Christ to us. Stand firm in the promise of the eternal life that we have in Christ, of the inheritance that we have, of being adopted as your children through Christ. Lord, we pray for our very hearts. Will we turn from ourselves? May we turn to you. So we thank you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. May the Lord, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord smile on you, shine his light upon you. May the Lord lift you, turn his face towards you, give you his peace, give you his bless we came. Bless we came to this place today. Bless now we will go in the name of the Father, the Spirit and the Son. Bless we came to this place today. Bless now we will go in the name of the Father, the Spirit and the Son. So go now in peace. Go now in. Let's all pray with me. Holy Father, as you have blessed us beyond measure in Christ, by the grace that you freely offer us and freely give us, and the mercy that is given to us in Christ, and the riches of your mercy that are seen each and every morning. Lord, we pray that you would cause our hearts to turn to you, to trust in your provision, in your grace, in knowing that all has been settled in Christ, knowing that we can stand firm on your word and on your promises. Lord, we pray, would you renew the strength of your church, of your people this day, on, built on the foundation of your very word and on your truth, that, Lord, you may be glorified in our lives. And all that we do, would you be glorified. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.